All right. Good morning, everybody. Happy Friday. Here we are once again. My good friend Betty Hovey and I are together on Compliance Capers. My name is Sonal Patel with SP Collaborative LLC, and Betty Hovey is with CHCS Consulting. Hello, hey, uh, my friend. How you doing? Well, I'm hoping everybody's doing good because it is a Friday in June, and hopefully it's a sunshiny morning wherever everyone is tuning in from. I know I'm very happy. It's finally warming up. Yes, yes. We're getting a lot of, uh, uh, in Florida, they have a, a lot of, we had a lot of rain finally, which we greatly needed. So, um, you know, we always get the sunshine, not to brag, but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but we were, yes, we were short on rain. So we kind of picked up some of that. So now everything's nice and lush and, and pretty. Um, so very happy. Yes. Awesome. Very good. Well, now I'm happy that you're up here in the Midwest yes. enjoying a different climate for sure. Different yes. climate. Um, do you guys have that vicious bug that's out? We have them here. They're no, called we still, cicadas. Yeah, and they're we're here. having quite a lot of cicadas up here in the, um, you know, I don't know if it's because we're more rural here okay. on like the 20 acres, like in the middle of yeah. nowhere with woods so we have like yeah. the ticks and all that stuff the real with. ticks but, right, you know, right. so we don't we don't hear you know i haven't seen any cicadas up here yet no yeah well they're everywhere here and they are um making loud loud sounds each and every day for hours on end until it's their bedtime and they quiet down at like <laughs> seven and i'm like thank goodness because <laughs> i get deaf the windows are closed yeah. my ac is on um, again, because when I do things like this, it's incredibly loud. And so I always yeah. feel if the windows are open, people can hear. Yeah. Um, it's not like our good friend, Pam Vanderbilt, when she does her presentations outside in Florida oh, and we, heard, we hear her those lanai. beautiful birds on her <laughs> lanai and those birds are talking and it's just so charming. No, cicadas are not charming <laughs> nothing at all. Nothing charming about that, no. <laughs> nothing charming at all at all. But um, yeah, that's why my windows have to be closed. But anyway, uh, I digress. We digress per usual, our shenanigans of our very well. own on Fridays. Um, you know, but we wanted to come back to our audience this week, continuing on our conversation on the Targeted Probe and Educate program that we introduced everybody to last Friday on the vast and robust details of the targeted probe and educate the TPE process. It's very lengthy. Um, the multiple three rounds have to be followed swimmingly. And we implore you that you need to pass on either round one, round two, or round three um, to be sure you don't get kicked over to one of the UPICs or one of the RAC auditors, et cetera, that we definitely hinted to um, in last week's episode. So for today's episode, I really wanted to uh, start talking about a particular TPE that is going on currently in a specific MAC location. And of course, it's one of our very favorites, Novitas, um, simply because they've always been at the forefront of providing education, in my opinion. When I lived in Texas for over a decade, um, it used to be known as Trailblazer back in the old days, but they were amazing with their education. And when they handed the baton over to Novitas, I think the education stayed the same, like just really, really great, terrific education. But so for today's conversation, uh, we have information on current TPE for the evaluation and management visits yes. that are going on, everybody. And they are talking about those ENM visits uh, based on new documentation guidelines that took over in 2021. And I know my good friend and I here talk about this new um, ENM stuff all the time. And we try our very best to provide uh, robust education on it. But look, here's CMS. They gave us a little bit of grace time, right? But here they are actually looking um, at those established uh, outpatient and office visits. 
again, based on the new overhaul of guidelines that took effect on January 1st, um, a few years ago. So they gave us a few years of quiet time, but here they've come in. Right, Betty? I mean, I think it, it was time. Yeah. Uh, we, we in the industry expected it. So, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, we got that COVID break too, you know, True. where nothing True. was going on. And then, you know, now they're catching yeah. things up. And I was listening to Angela Jordan um, the other day. Mm -hmm. And um, she was uh, speaking about TPE a little bit and, and what she was talking about and had said that um, one of the things that she was saying was that because of the shift and so many more 99214s, you know, yes. going out, uh, right. that the TPE on E&M was like in full swing, like everywhere. So this one that you pulled for today should be um, definitely applicable to a lot of people that are listening. And, um, you know, and it's just e &M, everybody does it unless you're like pathology or radiology, you know, um, right. you're going to be doing it. So it's a good one to hit for everybody. But um, yeah, they, they really are hitting the e &M a lot right now. So it's uh, definitely uh, timely to be talking about. That's right. So why don't I go ahead and put up a little link for the audience here regarding um, this uh, TPE active list as well as inactive. So they've combined both onto kind of a one to two page PDF document um, that is available on both of the jurisdictions for Novitas. So there's the same issue they're seeing, um, like I hinted at last week, right? If one region is seeing it out in Washington, D.C., that Novitas, the Novitas out in Texas is also seeing similar issues as well. So this uh, one to two page PDF is going to really highlight and show you that both J.H. and J.L., are uh, pinpointing TPEs out for their providers um, who they've highlighted and spotlighted uh, for this evaluation and management established patient um, situation. And so they are gonna be requesting, uh, you know, handfuls of documentation from a variety of these providers on both coasts. Yep. Well, is Texas a coast? Well, whatever, you know, Southern <laughs> Texas, as well as the East Coast people um, at Novitas, right? So, you know, it's just really important that uh, people in the audience take the time to look at their individual MAC web pages to see what they're highlighting, right? Um, so when I pulled this document up, you know, there are quite a few that are inactive, but that means they're they're done, like the TPEs right. are completed. And so there were quite a few that are listed as inactive. Um, but for the current active uh, states of TPEs, there are about nine. And I know for today, we're going to talk about specific to the ENM, but there are others as well, which we will uh, showcase later on as the month goes on. But, you know, when you and I provide that education over these past few years for the quote unquote higher level uh, e &M services, right? That level four, that level five, they're even looking at level threes here. Um, you know, so it's really important for the audience to understand those documentation requirements, right? Uh, just in the basic education for this new overhaul. I guess I can still keep saying new because we lived with the 95 and 97 for like 25 Forever. years, right? Forever. So, you know, I think we can safely still keep saying this is new um, because our providers haven't necessarily uh, completely mastered um, all of these new uh, areas for, you know, the problems addressed, the data analyzed, and then the risk to complications. All three of these buckets um, need to be better structured uh, in the documentation for the certified coding professionals, even the physician um, 
people, folks who are interested in actually providing the codes on their own. Um, it's really important to help structure your documentation so you can better code um, for those types of services. Um, that's just some food for thought that I had. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, um, something good. I, I think, you know, to your point, um, we have a lot of physicians and APPs that still didn't get the 95 and 97 guidelines. After all well, it's time. hard. All oh. those bullet points, bullet point, bullet points. Yeah, it was a lot. So, well, but sure. I mean, so if, if, you know, it doesn't surprise me that yeah. since 21, True. you know, True. that, yeah, and then they change them again in 23. So I'm like, yeah, I'm not surprised we still have questions. So I'm like, That's right. Yeah, I would kind of expect it. It took a couple of decades to get the other and some of them still didn't get it. So um, yes, yes. But it's always uh, because again, almost all practices do it. You know, it's something that everybody needs to understand. You know, your bread and butter might be surgery and that might be where you make big bucks, but you still have to see the patients and you That's treat nice. the patients for non-surgical things too. So, you know, that part of the house has to also be in line and be following what the, the guidelines and the regulations are. That's right, Betty. Absolutely. And that, I, I know we're laughing, but it's, a pretty good uh, statement that you made there that it did take a very long time for the majority of our practitioners to get 95 and 97, right? So it's gonna take a little bit more time um, for our providers to really and truly embrace. I know what you and I continue to say in education is that this way of documentation is so much better. Yeah. Um, so much better, right? There's less of that bean counting and, yeah. you know, um, over analyzing the body systems when it's not necessary yeah. for the problem that the patient is coming in for. That's why I was always very resistant to the old ways. I'm like, why does the provider have to look at all of these various organ systems and body parts for something that doesn't yes. require it? Yeah. To me, it was just illogical. Um, so I like this way much better, a medically appropriate and relevant physical examination, right? You yep. don't need to do a head to toe examination for a simple hand laceration, right? You don't need to go into each and every body system for something like that. Yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah, so, you know, Novitas has a really good way again, about education in providing um, these, these checklists for documentation. And they do a really good job for ENM documentation checklists. Um, that's a really good thing for our providers to take a look at and make sure, um, especially if you do happen to fall into this jurisdiction of either JH or JL for the Novitas um, space. So Betty, I would love to hear uh, if you could give the audience a little bit of detail on what their specific checklist is actually spotlighting for yes. these providers. Well, if you um, go to the link that someone put on, and again, y'all, I got it on my paper. I printed it out. So that's right. <laughs> it's kind of to Perfect. help the providers um, if they're getting um, the ADRs. So uh, if you do get the notice from Novitas that you are have been chosen to fall under this TPE for ENM, and they're requesting that 20 to 40 records from you, um, you know, going through the checklist is kind of a helpful way, which I think is good because they're, they're like, we're trying to help you out, you know, because if you yeah. send them stuff and it's not complete and they give you a bad score and then you say, oh, well, well, we didn't have, we didn't send this and we didn't send that. We didn't know. Well, then they have to stop. You have to get it. They have to re-review it. So on their end, they're spending more time and money for their people to re-review something that wasn't complete in the first place. So for them to give you the checklist, it's not only helping you out, it's actually helping them out. So you get it done the first time. Um, so I, I, you know, kind of serves both when, when you get these, but it's, 
is something that Sonal and I talked about. I know we talked about last week when we were talking about the TPE program in general, but we've talked about many other times. If you ever do get an ADR from Payor, make sure you send everything so that you, you know, don't have issues. So when you look at the checklist, that they're sending out with the ADRs for records, you know, it says, you know, make sure it's the correct person you're sending us, you know, like, uh, you know, don't you know, send PHI for somebody we're not asking you right. for. Um, right. Make sure it's the correct date of service. Uh, make sure that there's a legible signature. Uh, we're finding a lot. Uh, I am with my clients and I know you've seen it too, Sonal, where electronically they're signing, mm -hmm. but if they don't print it out right from the EHR, the signatures aren't there, even though they did electronically sign it. And if it's not there for the person at Novitas, when they evaluate, they're going to say, oh, sorry, there's no signature. Then right. once again, it's going to have to go back. You're going to have to reprint to show it. And, you know, so they're like, make sure the signature's on there. Um, make sure that it's supporting a face-to-face -face encounter. But I, I think the interesting pieces that pertain to, you know, make sure you're checking the stuff out is it says if billing service is based on MDM, all relevant documentation that supports the level of service build, like the progress notes, the physician's orders and intent, ER records, consult reports, radiology, diagnostic tests, EKG, lab, path, et cetera. So they're reminding you, mm -hmm. you know, make sure you're sending all that stuff so that, you know, we're able to give you the credit for it that, you know, you validly took in the first place, but now we need to verify that. So we need to see it, you know, and then if you're doing it by MDM, they're reminding you that, you know, make sure the documentation is indicating how many problems were addressed, the data and the risk. So make sure that, you know, the, the, the evaluation and management notice is complete. And then if it's based on time, make sure you're being supportive of the time that's there. Um, make sure you're supporting any modifiers and then incident too, because that was actually listed as one of the big errors for TPE for this e &M um, um, TPE was incident two guidelines not being followed. So they're also That's putting true. that out there that if you did this incident two, make sure, you know, that it's the following those guidelines of no new patient or no established patient with a new problem, you know, like it, it better kind of make up what, what incident two is supposed to be. And you need to show that the physician that made the treatment plan is staying involved in the patient care. I think that's one of the pieces where they may be having trouble with the incident to services is proving that you know, they send one note and the physician is never mentioned in the note. The physician signs off on it and the PA has signed it, but that how does that doesn't really prove involvement that proves they signed it, they countersigned it, but what does that mean? So, mm -hmm. you know, where, you know, where's that note that has the original treatment plan the physician made that the PA is following or in that note, does it say I'm following the treatment plan provided by Dr. Smith, you know, so that it's proving that they're following incident two guidelines. That's something I think for those of y'all that are doing incident two, that wouldn't hurt to be putting that in there um, because it, it really puts out there that you are following incident two and deserve that extra 15% kick up. Um, so, you know, it's a pretty comprehensive little checklist just to make sure y'all have everything when you send it off to them. So it doesn't cause some denied stuff at the first, you know, when you have that yeah. round one meeting and they say, you know, this was wrong. We kind of, this is an error, this, and, and you, you say, oh, well, I have all this other stuff that supports that. And then they're like, well, why didn't you send it? And, you know, so again, to avoid all that, follow the little checklist and make sure everything is in there that they're asking for. Exactly. Thanks, Betty. Thanks for reading those details and, of course, highlighting that nightmare, in my opinion, of Incident 2. Once again, it rears its ugly head here um, yeah. in this particular TPE. Um, and, of course, it's going to rear its ugly head because um, our providers still haven't gotten it right. Uh, so you made some really great points there on the breakdown, uh, the nitty gritty of what is required uh, to meet and keep uh, the billing standards for the incident to construct, which again, be mindful, it is a Medicare 
construct. Yes. Um, I don't know how many questions I get in a month that are pertaining to incident two for other payers, right? Um, yes. And if I'm not privy to all of the information on contracts and uh, individual payers themselves, um, you know, all I can do is advise, please go research. Yes. Does yes. that commercial plan follow Medicare or do yes. they have their own you know, words for some sort of incident to policy. They well, could right. call it something else, you know, but, yeah. um, you know, you got to be really, really mindful and and uh, take advantage of checklists like this that Medicare puts out there. Um, and Novitas yeah. has done a really great job for this particular unique circumstance of the TPEs that are going out to their jurisdiction. And so, you know, if you are a provider who gets hit with this type of a TPE, print out that one to two page PDF, please, um, and check it. Like, you know, each time you complete a section, check it off. That is what a checklist is for, to make sure that you are sending them all of that supplementary information that will support the medical necessity of that service. A, a good tip just to throw in there since you're saying it like that. I also have my clients include the checklist in with the records when they send it for each one yeah, so that when exactly. the payor gets it, they see that I checked off. It should. So you don't come back to me and say, Oh, well you didn't. Mm -hmm. I, yes, I did. It's in there, you know, to make it's sure there. that that's they're right. looking for the right things that, you know, um, so that that's kind of, I think a good thing too to send it along for each mm -hmm. record that mm -hmm. you've checked the list off and that anything applicable, you know, has already been done. Absolutely. And sometimes you, you do, there's nothing wrong with spoon feeding the right. Mac, the information that you've provided, right? Cause they're very, very busy. It's a large entity. They have lots of documentation that's being bombarded on them every day. So I think it's fine if you spoon feed them, this checklist. Yes, I've provided you with all 15 of these things on your checklist in my large documentation packet um, that will support uh, all of my services for this TPE audit. Um, so yeah, that's a great pro tip. Uh, there's nothing wrong with spoon feeding and pointing out exactly where this supportive documentation actually is. Uh, to thwart them from coming back to you and saying, oh, hey, buddy, I don't see this this particular order. It's not there. And you can say, no, in fact, I checked yeah. it off my list. Here it is, you know, on this particular page of my packet. It's right there. Yeah. So, yeah, that's a great, that's a great tip. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, I also wanted to put up our final uh, link for today's conversation on the um, sort of progress to date results um, chart that Novitas includes, um, just to keep all of us in the know on, you know, what they're doing, what stage they're at in their jurisdiction for this ENM TPE. Um, and so from what I remember, Betty, is that, of course, um, all of this evaluation and management ENM services for this TPE are going to be for the established office outpatient visits with our CPT codes. Again, like we hinted to earlier, the highest CPT code 99215, as well as the moderate CPT code 99214, and then the low for the 99213. And also, they're going to be taking a look at subsequent hospital inpatient or observation care with that CPT code of 99232. So that's their entire um, TPE that they're looking at for this jurisdiction. But these results in the TPE rounds, um, they're, they've only basically worked on round one um, as far as I can see on these um, six PDF pages or so. Is that about accurate, Betty? Yeah, yeah, that's that's what I saw when I was looking at it, okay. that uh, 
um, starting in June of 2023, I think was the earliest one where they started having uh, rounds listed, but all of them are round one and they're kind of staggered. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, they're, they're all dealing with those uh, established um, office okay. and then the outpatient side. So, yep. That is excellent. Um, and the only thing that I wanted to say that was really noteworthy of these charts that they provide um, again, is that they are basically giving that date span, that scope of when they're looking at records. Um, but then in terms of the results, they want to break it down into three sections and they call them minor. So there are minor errors, uh, there are moderate, and then there are major. Um, so that is how they, they, they break it down in these various date spans that they're involved in um, so far in round one, um, but but for the general top denial or partial reasons for their denial is of course going to be medical necessity, uh, insufficient documentation comes in there as well, um, you know, and in the varying uh, stages. Um, and so that's how they break it down. You know, the documentation submitted does not support medical necessity as listed in coverage requirements, or they state insufficient documentation was provided to support the services as billed to Medicare. And then they also stress that they've made multiple attempts to correct these error types before completing their review. And then they also talk about insufficient documentation uh, if it's submitted, did not support incident to services, like you stated earlier, or then the documentation submitted supported a higher or a lower level of medical decision making. Um, so that is interesting that there are times when they're going to, you know, state one way or the other. It could have been higher or lower, but it wasn't accurately coded, right? Uh, because the CMS is all about their accuracy metrics and performance levels uh, that that they want providers to strive for. Yeah. yeah and that's something you know, if you undercode it, it's still wrong. And Correct. you know, it's still an error and, and goes into your error rate. You know, because when you talk to the max, they're like, you know, wrong is wrong. I don't care if it's wrong in our favor or wrong in your favor. It's just not right. Mm -hmm. You know, so it, it uh, doesn't play into what they're looking at. They're looking at the hard figure of yes or no, as far as mm -hmm. that goes with what the level is. Um, but um, again, um, the the list that you read off and once again, for y'all, if you go to that link she gave, they list them all right there for you of what those denials have been so far that they looked at with the um, insufficient documentation, medical necessity, all that stuff. So in the practice, you know, y'all can be looking at these things, go to whatever your Mac is and look at the, the, the TPE stuff. And if you look at what the top denial and partial denial reasons are so far, gives you something for your practice to be mm -hmm. looking at, to make sure once again, you're staying on that right course. Um, you know, so check your own, you know, audit, yourself and check for the medical necessity. Make sure that the documentation is clear as to why the patient's there. That the ICD-10 codes are clear to what is documented. Um, and take a look at incident two guidelines, of course. Uh, and then, you know, the level in general, you know, is it accurate? Are you, you know, not under or over coding things, but is your documentation supporting the level of service that's being built out? Um, you know, because that's one of the things I always find interesting when people talk about overcoding, undercoding, that kind of thing, is that it's it's not about did you do the service? They know you did a service. And when you talk to the Max, um, they know that you probably build the right code. Mm -hmm. But the problem is the documentation doesn't support it. And that's why they talk about documentation submitted. It really doesn't matter if you did it or not. What they're looking at is from the auditing perspective of mm -hmm. does the documentation support it, period. You know, um, so they're not accusing the physician mm -hmm. or the APP of, you know, not doing the service or blatantly, you know, trying to get paid for something they didn't do, blah, blah, blah. They're just, 
stating the fact that the documentation doesn't support what you said, you know, uh, which is what we do, right? When we mm-hmm. audit someone, that's right. I have that's to right. go back to the doctors and how we talk to them. Yeah. We say, look, I know, I know, you know, whatever your specialty is, you know, this patient with this kind of disease or this complaint, we know that what you did really was a four problem is right. that's not what your documentation says, you know, mm-hmm. so they, they kind of keep talking about documentation because that's mm-hmm. the only thing that matters with these things. So that's what we have to focus on is getting the physicians and APPs to document what service they did. You know, they're doing the services and a lot of times they're do- they're they're coding the service they did. They're just not documenting the service they did. So that's what we always have to keep checking on. And that's why doing audits, <laughs> you know, get, keeps an eye on that and helps you tell them. So um, that's just my point on that. Yeah, that's a fabulous point on that. Fabulous point on that. That is why these targeted probe and educate stress the word educate, right? Because they literally are saying that, you know, in these TPE results that we went over, insufficient documentation, right, is pretty much up there. So they already understand, like you're stating, this is not a fraud type of an issue. You did the service, right? It is the 992.13.14 or 15. However, your documentation has to support that, right? I've always been saying that for years is it's coordinating documentation with that yep. claim that you push out the door. They yep. coordinate, right? And yep. so that has been the missing piece, the um, you know lack of attention to that very important piece, that documentation, right? Because in my opinion, it's much quicker, easier, faster to just push that claim out the door, oh, right? Sure. But just because the claim gets to CMS first doesn't mean that they're not going to ask for that documentation, that coordinating documentation. Um, yeah. That is the key. That is the absolute key feature. Um, and our providers have to get used to the structure and the parameters of what to meet in those three buckets for problems addressed, the data analyzed and the risk to complications, right? For the patient, two out of those three columns have to be met. They've been used to that from the old 1995, 1997. It's still two out of three, but again, there's different parameters. There's different structures within each of those three columns. And so that really is where that documentation has to support that moderate level of um, medical decision making. Um, You know, when we both attended a NamUs conference together years ago, I think that's where we first heard it coined to us. And that was Shannon DeConda. Let's just give a shout out to where a shout out is due. And she made me think. I think I was with you at that conference, or did she say it somewhere else? It doesn't matter. She said it. Um, Moderate. She made the room, you know, whip out a dictionary and talk about the definition of the word moderate, right? And it just means average. Average. Average, right? And here we are in healthcare space for all of these years getting scared that a level four is way too high of a service, right? When really all it is is an average medical encounter, an average service. Um, You know, so it's a great idea to have a mind shift, you know, um, on that word. It should not be so accusatory as we've been trained to think about that level four of an E&M visit, you know? Yeah, I I think some of that came when we had the five levels, because when we had five levels, three was in the middle. Three was in the middle. So if you were at a four, when you looked at the numbers, uh-huh. it was like, oh, we're above the middle. So, you know, that's where I think some of that nervousness. But then when you looked at and I said, well, yeah, I said, but even if you want to think of it that way, when we had the five levels, 
the nurse visit code, what everybody calls yeah. a nurse visit. But, I mean, right. you kind of throw that one out because the, the physicians yeah. and the APPs probably aren't using that one anyway. So exactly. now you are at four. Yes. You know, so when you exactly. look at it that way, well, then it's not such a scary thing to be over mm -hmm. there where the four is. You know, but I really do think that's where a lot of that came from was, you know, oh, you know, and then the, the magic bell curves that Medicare oh, had everywhere where everything was going up at that three. Well, that's because it was in the middle. That's why people were picking exactly. it. So much. Exactly. Um, and so once they started getting education and now mm -hmm. with the change and doing away with one of those to where we have the four levels, people's right. mind shifts have changed too. Yes, um, exactly. And so I think CMS kind of needs to catch up a little bit with that. Agreed. And Agreed. stop saying, oh, these mm -hmm. fours, why are there so yes. many? Well, exactly. because they should have been fours back then too. Back maybe. then. You know, exactly. so Correct. now they just understand better, you know, and that's mm -hmm. the way the practice needs to feel. You know, exactly. yes, that before, not instead of like, oh, ooh, it's a four. Ooh, it's a four. It's a four. Exactly. Period. That's exactly. it. Exactly. You know? Exactly. Exactly. And that's how you and I teach our yep. providers that you and I audit together. That's exactly correct. We're like, what is this? This is a moderate. This should be increased. This yep. is a level four. So yes, yeah, so we have to change the mindset of our providers as well. Again, because the, the industry has been sort of um, pushed into thinking that these, these quote unquote higher levels of service um, were a bad thing when really they are just a moderate average level of service to, you know, the everyday man or woman who comes in for a encounter. Again, based on the new guidelines, the problems addressed, the data analyzed, and then that risk of complications, right? Just meeting two out of those three. Um, yeah, we teach this all the time, how it could easily be done to support a level four. Um, once <laughs> compliantly, right, right, right. Compliantly, of course, once we show you how to do it for each of those columns based on your yep. patient population specifically. Yeah, for sure. So, you know, this uh, TPE that was released uh, to Novitas and many of the other jurisdictions, which we did not talk about in today's presentation, but they are being looked at across the country as well. Um, and again, primarily for the number one uh, instances of insufficient documentation, um, because again, if things are coded to that established level three, four, or five, that supporting documentation has to reflect that coded claim that CMS already has, right? And so again, if there's a volume um, that's way too much for that level three, four, or five, they're going to pinpoint you. And yep. they're going to want to take a look at you closely uh, for that coordinating documentation like we've been talking about uh, throughout today's conversation. Yep. But I know you and I are very passionate advocates for this new ENM overhaul, um, you know, since since 2021. So I'm just happy to continue teaching and advising on how to get that documentation um, to actually meet the code that was chosen on that claim. So, yes. yeah. <laughs> yes, all good stuff today. Um, just be confident in what you're doing. Make sure the documentation is where it needs to be. And I think it, another thing to remember, you know, people get nervous when they get anything from the payors, of course, especially when it's Medicare. Um, but the TPE program is, is the, as Sonal had said a little bit ago, you know, don't forget about that education piece. This is like one of their only programs where, you know, they're, they're trying to help you and mm -hmm. there's nothing punitive going on uh, right. during the three rounds. You know, they really are trying to educate, to help you improve what you're doing, to make sure you're documenting appropriately to support what is billing out. Of course, after the three rounds, if you're not listening to them, it, it, <laughs> it will go the other way, yeah. but uh, yeah. you know, this is one of the programs where it's like, hey, we're trying to help you, you know, so make sure if you do get ADRs for a notice for the TPE that, that you take advantage of all the stuff they're telling you to um, uh, because they're 
at this point, you know, um, they're trying to make sure you improve to get to where, you know, they don't have to worry about you and it doesn't go any further. So, um, you know, take full advantage if you are under a TPE, uh, in, in a TPE for one reason or another that, that you, you know, fully take advantage of the sessions that you have with them to make sure everything's okay and to ask all your questions about things, especially, you know, if they're Medicare specific to what their guidelines are, you know, they should be able to educate you on all that stuff. Exactly right, Betty. Yep. They're gung ho on this education piece um, on this particular program that they developed right back in 2017 um, that they flushed out for all of the suppliers and providers in 2017. So I think it's a great thing. Um, it's just a matter of uh, our providers paying attention um, and doing the right thing in round one, two, or in round three. Again, like I've stressed again and again, it doesn't matter when you pass, you just need to pass. You just need to pass, you know, and, and if you do happen to be a provider um, in this particular jurisdiction of Novitas, Betty and I are very, very great educators in this evaluation and management space and would be happy to take a look, try to help you, um, you know, pass these things. Uh, because again, like we've stated, and like you can look for yourselves, this jurisdiction is only in round one um, of the TPE process. And so there's still going to be uh, a bit more time um, that they're going to give you for the round two. Those results will be posted. Then round three, those results will be posted. Um, and then it can become inactive like the others are on that list that they provide you. So, you know, I, I think this has been a really good episode for the mm -hmm. audience to just get a better handle on something specific that's going on. Um, and it has been the buzzworthy past couple of years, right, for evaluation and management code overhauls. And yep. so we knew this was coming. We knew this was uh, going to be in the spotlight and here it is. Um, and they're giving you guys, you guys in the provider space, another chance at obtaining that education. They're giving you another chance. And so definitely um, take them up on that nurse review education that you'll get. Uh, Cause like I said last week, it is, it, it's going to be an amazing, you know, slide deck type of a presentation if not a telephonic conversation that you have with that nurse that can really help make sure that your documentation is buttoned up to support those codes. Yeah. Yeah. So, all right, my friend. Well, oh my God, time has gotten away from us per yes. usual. <laughs> um, but we will be back together again next week for another current and active TPE that is going on in the country. So I can't wait to talk about that one next week. Yep. Sounds good. Y'all have a good week and a good weekend and we'll see you next time. That's right. Bye, my friend. Bye.